started. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Marketing Cloud Consultant Bootcamp Day 1. I am Jyotsna Bitra. I go by the name JB. I am the Marketing Cloud Consultant and the Marketing Champion. I co-lead the Salesforce Marketers Group Phoenix and I'm a 16 times certified application architect and a trailblazer mentor. And I'm joined by Corina and Jenna today. Corina is go going to talk about the exam topic, account configuration, and Jenna is going to help us moderate the Q&A section. And before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the YouTube channel, Trailblazing Together. I will send the link in the chat window in a short while. And uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please post them in the chat window and we will address them at the end of the presentation. And if there are any unanswered questions, post them in the Slack channel. I hope you all have joined the Slack channel. I will post the link to the Slack channel again in the chat window. So uh, you, if you have any unanswered questions after the presentation, post them in the Slack channel. And any updates or any resources that we are going to share regarding this bootcamp will be shared on the Slack channel. Be sure to follow all the updates on this channel. And here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to quickly uh, have a overview of the Marketing Cloud certifications available and in detail about the Marketing Cloud Consultant certification, a couple of useful resources that will help you uh, with the preparation for the certification and a couple of tips. And we likely touch upon how uh, this bootcamp is going to be scheduled and um, how we are going to operate this one. And we will jump on to the exam topic, uh, account configuration. Corina is going to talk all about it. So first, the first and foremost question, why we get certified? So you may wonder, uh, we don't need certification as a testification, um, testimony to your skill set that you already have. You are good at performing your job. You don't need extra credential for that. But getting certified has its own benefits. It can help you progress in your career and it's a great way to showcase to the world that you are capable of doing something. You have the skill set, you have the ability to perform some functionality. And it also shows your commitment to your company's success and your professional growth. And you don't know um, if when you get certified, you may uh, get into new opportunities. And preparing for the certification also helps you focus on some of the technical aspects that you haven't focused on before. And here's an overview of all the certifications that are available in the marketing cloud arena. You may wonder why there are four certifications for just one platform. Well, marketing cloud is very robust and extensive. Um, to start with the marketing cloud administrator certification, it tests your knowledge um, on um, your administration and configuration capabilities in the marketing cloud. It also tests uh, your knowledge on the data structure, subscriber data management, and uh, how thoroughly you can navigate the setup and troubleshoot the account configuration. This marketing cloud administrator certification is a prerequisite for the marketing cloud consultant cert. And the next one, marketing cloud email specialist. This is for those who have experience in following the marketing best practices, message design, subscriber and data management, inbox delivery, uh, reporting and tracking metrics, uh, email automation, and so on. And this is a prerequisite for the marketing cloud developer. The marketing cloud developer certification tests um, knowledge on uh, your experience developing dynamic and personalized marketing um, assets such as emails, landing pages, forms, which includes uh, the AMP script, SSJS, and it also tests your knowledge on SQL and um, other marketing cloud APIs. And our next one, the marketing cloud consultant, we'll look at it in detail. So this is for individuals who have experience configuring complex marketing cloud solutions. And for those who have mastered the implementation of marketing cloud by demonstrating best practices, 
executing deployment of campaigns and finalizing custom solutions for customers. And um, a consultant should also be able to meet customer business requirements that are maintainable, scalable, and contribute to long-term success. And here's the exam format. Like any other certifications, there are going to be 60 questions. All the answers are going to be multiple choice or multiple select. The time for this exam is one hour 45 minutes and the passing score is 67%. And uh, soon after you finish the exam, you will get uh, the result, whether it's a pass or a fail. And you will also get an email with section level feedback, how you did on each section. The fee for this exam is $200. And the prerequisite is the Marketing Cloud Administrator Cert. Co compared to the Marketing Cloud Administrator Cert, this has more scenario-based questions. And you will definitely need experience to clear this cert. And here's the exam outline. These are the different um, topics that are tested on. The discovery and architecture takes up 16%, integration 20%, account configuration 12%, automation, which uh, includes the automation studio, journey builder, and the custom uh, scenarios that is going to take 20%, data modeling and management 21 and messaging 11%. And here are some useful resources. The first one is the most popular article created by Gilda. It, talk, it talks about the resources available for preparing for all the four marketing cloud certifications. So in here, you will find the resources for the marketing cloud certifi uh, consultant certification as well, along with some useful blogs. And the second one is the exam guide that is available on the trailhead. And if you want to take this further and attend a course um, done by the Trailhead Academy, you can uh, check out this link. And here are my top uh, certification tips. Before I get started uh, thinking about uh, taking a certification, I would just go and review the exam guide find out what all listed in there, what are the topics covered, and also evaluate myself uh, where I stand. How much time would I need to prepare? Uh, where are the uh, gaps um, uh, that are there? And uh, identify the time that I need for each of the topics. And then I will uh, roughly come up with a date. And the next and foremost um, important thing that I do is go ahead and book the certification because I strongly believe uh, whatever that gets scheduled is the one that gets done. So once we have that scheduled, we feel motivated and we feel accountable and we try to set aside time. We try to get rid of all the excuse excuses that we make. So I, I would just go ahead and schedule the exam. And next, uh, while you are attending the bootcamp, I would also encourage you to uh, set aside some time every day as you are attending the bootcamp at 9 a.m. Eastern every day, on the other days as well, set aside some 60 to 90, 90 minutes and uh, revise the topics that we have discussed on each session. And also uh, prepare all the useful resources that we are going to share. And there is nothing uh, that beats the practice, uh, the hands-on practice. Um, so I would encourage you, if you have uh, the Marketing Cloud instance, uh, go and set up, uh, configure, and try to practice it. And if you can find any study group, try to join the group. If there are no groups, uh, uh, you can take the initiative and create a study group. And uh, there are some practice exams available on Udemy. On, I'm not sure if it is available on the web assessor. You can uh, check out and take up uh, the practice exams to test your knowledge and also get an understanding of how the exam questions are going to be. And during the exam, if you're unsure about uh, the answer for a particular question, mark the question. I found this really helpful because at the end of the test, when I'm done answering all the questions that I'm confident, I will go back to the questions that I marked and I'll go with a fresh perspective. And then I, it would be easier for me to come up with the answers. 
And sometimes um, it's not always that um, we clear the certification on the first attempt. It's OK to fail. Um, just make sure uh, to check out the section level feedback and brush up on the topics that you, you, you have scored less. And we strictly do not encourage uh, dumps. And there is no uh, replacement for the real world experience. We're all here to share uh, the insights um, on what it takes to be a consultant. Um, so we are we are here to provide you all the extra help. So be, be sure to uh, reach out to us on the Slack channel. So the homework for today is after the session, set aside 10 to 15 minutes and review the exam guide. Check what's there on the exam, what topics are listed and identify where you stand and how much time you may need, how much time you can make each day to spend for the preparation. And then try to schedule a date depending on your commitments and your uh, time uh, and your bandwidth. And block time on calendar each day. Uh, on, on all the days where there is no session happening, block some time on your calendar and spend that time preparing for the certification. And if you follow this uh, regularly throughout this bootcamp, and I, I'm sure you'll be almost there, uh, almost ready to take the certification. And the last uh, homework for you would be to find a study group if it is there. If not, you can take the initiative and create one. And we would like to uh, see your progress. So whatever progress that you're making, whatever, whatever you're learning each day, uh, we would appreciate if you can share it in the Slack channel so it can motivate the other people as well. And next, here's the bootcamp schedule. So we are in the day, day one, uh, we're going to cover the exam topic, account configuration. And um, every Tuesday and Thursday, around the same time, we have all the other sessions scheduled, except for the day three. Uh, the journey builder se uh, session is going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern. All the other sessions are going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern. And there's going to be a major announcement at the end of the session. Please plan to stay after the Q&A. I take the privilege of introducing the bootcamp speakers and we have got all the marketing club gurus in here and it can't get any better. I feel so fortunate for having them join us. And our today's topic, account configuration, it takes up 12% of the exam and um, maybe around like eight questions. And this will cover the account hierarchy, reply mail management, SAP, IP warming, business units. Uh, Corina is going to more talk in depth about this. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Corina. Corina Thank you. All right, let screen. me get, yeah. I'm gonna swap over to my screen here real quick. All righty. I was going to try and turn on my camera, but it appears that now that I'm sharing my Google slides, I don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> uh, well, man, I skipped ahead. So. Um, Welcome everybody and thank you so much for attending tonight. Uh, I'm so glad I get to kick things off. Um, account configuration will help set a strong foundation for pretty much the whole rest of the certification classes. Um, I always say that, <clears throat> oh, there's my video piece. <laughs> there we go. So I always say that your account is only as strong as your implementation. Um, a marketing cloud consultant's role is very important uh, they are the first people that are the brand goes to in order to get advice on how to set up their account for the most success. Um, it's not something you should rush through. Uh, all of these configuration pieces are basically what leads into the successful use of the tool for everyone else. Um, you'll be setting up access for people, um, security. It'll be where you turn on certain studios. And so people are gonna to come to you as a consultant with these grand ideas and these really cool marketing campaigns that they've seen other people do. And it's your job to figure out what it is that it takes in order to get that implemented and created so that they can go in and start using it. 
a lot of the other roles uh, or certification roles can be an actual end user, but the job of a consultant is to think strategically and actually come up with how this is going to be used by other people. You very rarely get to be the one that actually then gets to go in and use the tool and do all of these things. Um, and so, yeah, here's my Twitter handle, my LinkedIn, and my Trailblazer community IDs. And a little bit about myself is I work for Famous Footwear, and actually I work for the parent company, which is called Colaris. We have 12 shoe brands, and then Famous Footwear is kind of our wholesale side, which is what I work on. Um, I oversee email, SMS, and push. So I use the majority of Marketing Cloud. We also use Ad Studio, and we're about to uh, have even stronger adoption because we've had so much success with the acquisition forms that you can integrate with uh, Facebook and Instagram that now they're interested in using the rest of it. So we're really excited to even be adding on more pieces uh, to our Marketing Cloud Studio. And then I'm also the leader, well, new now co-leader of the Marketing Cloud user group here in Denver. Uh, so I am just one state over from the Phoenix group. So hopefully one of these days we'll be able to get back, get together and do something cool together. Um, I'm also a marketing champion. And then last year I won an EIS award for email marketing excellence, which I am very proud of because I've never had an emailing trophy before. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as I've said before, marketing cloud is only as powerful as its implementation. Like I believe it so much that there's a whole slide for it because that I run into so many companies that I've worked for or consulted with where they hate marketing cloud and it's not marketing cloud's fault. They've had a really bad build out or they have um, just, change in the way that they actually want to use Marketing Cloud from what they originally paid for, um, that it's now incredibly limiting. But the thing with Marketing Cloud is it's actually limitless. It's very much like a lot of the Adobe tools that you use for like Photoshop, where you can do the same thing like 20 different ways if you want to. Um, so that's why I always say that Marketing Cloud is only, only as powerful as its implementation. All right, so we're going to start with Discovery. And Discovery, I believe, is a whole section of the exam. But discovery is important because you don't know how to configure an account until you've done some discovery questions. So we're going to do a little bit of covering discovery tonight, just so you know kind of the questions to ask so that you know what actions to take in order to configure your account. Um, so here is kind of my list of questions. There are many, many more. Usually you have some giant document within a consulting agency that um, you would go through um, and ask all the questions, or actually usually a project manager. It really depends on kind of what your role is. But these are kind of some of the, the most common ones. So um, you always want to know the organizational structure of the business so that you can actually uh, build out the tool to make sure that it's doing whatever it needs to. So whether it be like my company, where we're a portfolio of brands, or it could just be a um, national non-for-profit that has chapters all over the country, or it could even be a small business that just has um, one account. There are all kinds of different users within Marketing Cloud, um, and you need to be able to understand what each will need on different levels. Um, and then also you need to ask, obviously, who needs access, um, because that's you have to be able to create different users and roles and permissions based off of who needs access and what they're going to be doing. Um, and then a lot of the external tools, you'll need to know what external tools they're going, they plan to connect to the marketing cloud or, and if they plan on you doing the implementation of that as well, or if you just need to leave areas open so that they can continue to add in other tools. Uh, data transmission is another huge one. That's a big piece that you'll have another whole evening just talking about data structures. Um, so we won't get into that one too much. And then how your customers are organized. This one can make or break your account depending on what you do. Um, you need to make sure there is some type of primary key and you really need to understand how the business works in order to have a primary key. Um, you can't have an email address as a primary key or a subscriber key if you want to be able to have more than one subscriber in an account, um, have an account with the same email address. So say a husband and wife share an email address, do you want two accounts with that same email address? If so, email address can't be your primary key, you would need some type of customer number instead. Um, 
how the company identifies itself. There are different packages that come depending on how they want to wrap themselves and how much they want to hide their use of marketing clap. So some companies will not care, won't have any type of packages, um, and they'll just send and everything will uh, have Marketing Cloud links in the bottom for unsubscribing, uh, that'll have branded unsubscribe pages and profile centers for Marketing Cloud, or there's companies that don't want anyone to know what tool it is that they use at all. And so they will have um, special sender authentication packages created what, that masks everything behind their brand and makes it look like it's just part of their domain. Um, and then also content organization. So this one, a lot of agencies don't ask about, but um, I spend a lot of time cleaning accounts. Um, a clean folder structure helps a lot of people be successful. So whether they wanna organize things by quarterly, monthly, and then weekly, however they wanna dwindle it down, or if they have um, like a rewards program and a non-rewards program, there are lots of different ways that you can organize an account. And so all of these questions lead to the action items that I have to the right. All right, so now we're going to start with business units. So a business unit is basically an account. It's just a fancy word for an account. So one of the first things that you do once you understand a company and how it works and how they plan to use marketing cloud is you decide how many accounts that it is that they need. And a lot of this depends on their organizational structure. Um, so for example, where I was talking about my company, my company, we have 12 different brands plus famous footwear. Not all of them use Marketing Cloud, but we do have 10 different business units. We have one for each brand. The reason we do that is because we want each brand to have its own private domain branding, which we'll talk about later as a sender authentication package. Uh, we want to be able to have all the subscribers separate so that there's no overlap and no one can accidentally email another brand subscribers just because their list isn't big enough. Uh, there are also, like I said, large non-for-profits that have chapters all over the country, um, such as Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts would be an example where they would probably have each state would have a business unit or maybe even each council because a council oversees large areas. Or say the MS Society where they have a chapter for every state. Um, those would each could be a business unit so that each chapter president could then oversee their own account, do their own marketing messaging, but there would be a master level account for the non-for-profit parent um, location. I use MS Society because they're here in Denver, um, but they would basically have a master level account where they could publish down pieces of content as well and kind of oversee all of these different chapters uh, while still giving them some creative freedom. So a lot of that is just asking the right questions um, and digging in as part of that discovery phase, um, as I said, that you'll cover later on, and we covered a little bit beforehand. Um, another nice piece that I was talking about are the shared items that you publish down. Um, I was talking about how you can share down the content. You can um, share subscribers if you want to, or you can keep them completely um, separate from each other. But with business units, you have that flexibility, or you can even have a little bit of a combination where some um, business units can share with each other while others are completely different. Um, we also even have some where we have the same brand with different locations and they each have a business unit. So we have um, Naturalizer is another one of my shoe brands and we have a Naturalizer US and a Naturalizer Canada. And part of the reason we have that is we also have different locations that they would contact as far as their mailing address if they had any um, legal issues um, all of that we want wrapped up as part of the account configuration. So we actually separated them out into two different accounts to make it much easier um, and clearer for the users of those accounts. And they don't, we don't have to risk the overlap between the US and Canada or accidentally sending an all US or English email or, U, or US version that's all English to a Canadian audience where part of it needed to be in French and we could legally be held accountable for that as well, um, say in Quebec. So there are lots of pieces, even with legalities, that can make it so that you want to keep your business units separated. And oh, we've got over most of these use cases. Sorry, I had to take a drink here real quick. All righty. Well, most of you are getting snow right now if you're here in the U.S. Instead of getting snow here, it's just been insanely dry um, in Colorado. <laughs> so give us back our snow, please. Um, but yeah, so here, like I said, companies with multiple divisions, um, an international brand with multiple locations, um, and a B2B company with a parent level and the ability to share content down. 
This is usually a question on the exam. So this is kind of like your red flag, like keep this in mind. Um, these are some used cases and you can find some others out there, but there's usually some type of question about setting up um, business units or figuring out how many business units that a company needs. Um, this is a big part of Marketing Cloud. Um, you see them talk about Enterprise 2.0 all the time. So you can guarantee that there is likely going to be business unit related questions. All right, and so here's a little bit more. Oh, nope, apparently I duplicated the slide. Or are we stuck in a loop? There we go, here we go. All right, security. <laughs> so security is then how all of your users are going to access Marketing Cloud. So once you've gone through, you've asked who's going to be using Marketing Cloud in what way, you figured out that you need roles and permissions. Another thing to ask is how they plan on people accessing the tool. There are two different options. Um, right now, there's a little bit more flexibility that you don't have to select these two options, but here soon you're going to be forced to adopt either um, MFA or SSO. And for those of you that don't know, I did um, write out what they are, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew the acronyms as well for when people um, are mentioning these acronyms, you know that it's related to security and logging in. Um, so single sign-on is controlled usually via a custom URL tied to your company's um, authentication tool. Um, so usually this is for your users that are on um, a virtual machine or work on network. And then they go to the special URL that they can only access on the network. And then from there, you would, they would log in with their normal credentials. Um, that's great for um, occasional users or people that you only want to access the tool while they are in the office or on the network. However, your power users cannot use SSO because if they want to use something like the Marketing Cloud app to be able to monitor SINs on say a holiday weekend without having to log into their computer, um, they can't do that via SSO. So those people will actually need MFA or multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is enabled for um, all users except those that have SSO. You have to authenticate via a username and a password and then it'll take you to an additional page that will prompt you for your MFA verification code. Um, there's a Salesforce tool app that you can use. Uh, we use the Microsoft app within uh, Calaris, as, like most companies that have a Microsoft Exchange setup or whatever they call it now. Um, but there's lots of different ways that you can authenticate and it works pretty much with any type of authentication app that your company is already having you use um, if you work virtually because um, most people have to have some type of authentication to get onto their virtual environment um, outside of the office. All right, and then here are our roles and permissions. So um, once people are in, then they need to be able to access different pieces. So this is where you have um, your roles that they can control what it is that they can access within the tool. Um, a lot of companies, when they don't know how to use Marketing Cloud, will leave everyone at Marketing Cloud Administrator so that they can access everything. It's the least restrictive. It gives you functionality to everything. It says accept email studio, but I always go in as an administrator and check the email studio box and then I have access to everything. Uh, Marketing Cloud Viewer is the least, or the most restrictive that you can only look at things you can't really build anything or send it's just for viewing um, this can be good for a lot of executives if they want to go in and poke around and you don't want them to do any damage um, at the same time you have to um, give them access to the different studios but then make sure that they only have view only access um, marketing cloud security administrator these are good for your um, like network administrators within your company so that they can go in and um, configure like SSO for you or if they want to go in and do security audits because there's also some security reports that are tied to the security administrator roles now uh, marketing cloud editor and publisher. This is the one for a lot of your email specialists or your marketing managers, the ones that go in and create the different pieces. Um, I usually go in and either clone this one and add a bunch of other studios and pieces so that I can use it basically as my specialist power user, um, or I'll go in and just turn on different pieces um, within this actual one. <clears throat> Some of them you can edit, and then, but they're starting to um, take away a lot of those abilities now. And so I've started making it a habit of actually cloning whatever the role is and then adding in whatever roles and permissions it is that I want, which is the custom roles and permissions that you see as the last option. 
Um, I also use custom roles and permissions for, say, a consultant to access my tool. Um, since I'm brand side, I work with a lot of different consultants and agencies. Not everyone needs access to everything. So I have um, one agency that works with our smaller brands and they only access certain features because all they do is build and send on their behalf. They don't need to be able to touch Journey Builder. They don't need Automation Studio. They just need Email Studio. I have other agencies that cover the entire account um, for some of my brands because they don't want to hire anyone for email at all. And so they have a much looser agency um, custom role with lots more permissions with, so that they can touch lots more studios. Um, in addition to all of this, you also then give them permission or access to your different business units that they would want to access. And that's what I was talking about where my different agencies or even my different users will all have access to different business units. There are only three of us within the Calera's company that have access to every single business unit within the company. Um, and that's because all of us are the ones that work very um, heavy with the data and do all of the publishing, publishing down across all of the different business units or build out the same automations across all of the different business units on their behalf. Um, but if they're working for just a specific business or, or brand, they only get access to that business unit and whatever key areas it is that they need to make sure that nobody abuses any information, to make sure that there's no um, PII data out there um, that they could get a hold of. It, just make sure that all of our marketing data is intact and that um, the integrity of our data it, um, also remains intact because it's very easy for people to go in um, and start deleting things and contact builders so that suddenly your lists are gone or maybe they don't know what someone is um, and don't realize that those are a mobile or a pair of shoes or just because their email address field is empty. So there, <laughs> there are lots of dangerous things that you can do if you don't have the right rules and permissions turned on. Alrighty, and then so the next piece that is usually pretty important is your sender policy framework. So this is basically your handshake from Marketing Cloud into <clears throat> your ISPs, which are all of your inboxes. Uh, so in order for you to be able to get through those gateways, you have to have these records in place uh, that basically tell all of those ISPs, yes, I am this company, or yes, Marketing Cloud has permission to send on behalf of, this, of my company. Um, so I'm not going to go into what all of these authentication records are because you can, um, that's part of your studying, um, but just know that you need to basically know whether the company plans on using their domains, um, if they're going to host most of their records, or if they plan on using Marketing Cloud hosted records, um, because there's different pieces that you'll either need to engage a services team or support team, sorry, to be able to configure it on the Marketing Cloud side, or you will need to possibly even coach the network administrator how to configure this for Marketing Cloud as well with, uh, within their company. Um, as a newer Marketing Cloud consultant, you wouldn't be expected to know all of that. Um, unless you're like super techie and you came from more of the technical side and then getting into email, in which case, if you know all that, then um, two thumbs up. All right, so here's our sender authentication package, which is why we needed to understand the terms um, that we just looked at. Um, and what they plan on doing is because a similar authentication package is how you basically hide however much of uh, Marketing Cloud you want to let people know that you're using. So um, if you actually pay attention to when you click through on um, links or if you look at where um, images are hosted or even when you click the unsubscribe link, a lot of those will tell you what company it, or what ESP it is that a company uses. Um, unless they have something like a sender authentication package, in which case um, there are different levels that they can make sure that you're wrapped so that they um, can't tell at all. So, um, whether it be um, even custom profile centers instead of using the ones out of the box or um, just wrapping your uh, cloud pages and your image, your, uh, your image hosting URLs and your from addresses um, on your branded domain. Uh, you can also do account level branding where you can even make through Brand Builder, you can do different colors and um, styling and whatnot. It's not for your emails, that's just for your account to make it more stylized. Um, you also get a dedicated IP address. This is one of the main bonuses. A dedicated IP address means that you have your own unique IP address just for your account. You are no longer in a shared pool where if someone else is spamming, you're also going to have trouble getting to the inbox. You get your own unique IP address with all of your own um, records that we were just showing um, before 
your domain can also be branded. You can even use subdomains. So um, you don't have to just use whatever your company's domain is. Many times people have uh, multiple private domains such as email dot for their emails or um, some type of transactional piece for um, triggering off transactional related and even customer service ones if say they're like integrated with service cloud and want to have special service related um, domains and they can even have special IP addresses as well for each of those. So many companies will even take a dedicated IP address for the commercial sending and then have an additional dedicated IP address for the separate for their transactional sending. So that way they make sure whatever is going on with their commercial sending never tarnishes their ability to get to an inbox for transactions, or at least is less likely. And then finally, there's reply mail management. And reply mail management is what takes care of when uh, people say have a full mailbox and have their out of office, um, instead of you having your mailbox blow up every single time that you got an out of office or a manual unsubscribe request. Um, imagine emailing, say, 7 million subscribers and a few thousand end up bouncing for some reason for an outage and that came straight to your Outlook inbox, um, you would go crazy. So that's where reply mail management comes in um, and we'll take care of a lot of those based off of keywords and filters. Um, <clears throat> it's also when people reply back and say things like unsubscribe me you dirty spammer, it goes, oh, the word unsubscribe is in there. Let's go ahead and opt them out. Um, and then, yeah, I had already said, yeah, Cal's gonna have multiple private days. Oh, that was what I meant to also share. So when you have multiple business units, you can share a sender authentication package. Um, so you would have multiple business units all share one IP address, one private domain. Um, and what you can do is you can actually pay extra to have just private domains only added on in addition to the sender authentication package. So basically, um, you would share all of your IP addresses, your reply mail management pieces, um, but you, all of your different domains could say from email.whatever.com. So you don't have to have a sender authentication package for every single brand if you have a whole lot of brands and you're strapped for cash. Um, it's great to have at least some type of sender authentication package and then um, you can always work into having it across all of your different business units, um, but it can get very pricey. And then here are some of the use cases that you will likely see something similar to on your exam. Um, so a company with multiple brands wants branded domains for sending, linking, and image hosting. Um, a brand wants to create landing pages for subscriber acquisitions that are branded. So say they are gonna do a contest and they wanna host a signup form on a cloud page within Marketing Cloud, but they don't want it to have some sketchy uh, randomized URL. Instead, they can have a branded specialty um, domain that basically says, like us, we could do famousfootwear.com slash whatever we want to call the contest instead. Um, and we use that quite often, um, especially my smaller brands. Um, or a company with a portfolio of brands does not want to share IP addresses outside of their brands. So say like myself, we have the uh, 11 different accounts right now. And so that's enough sharing right there. Um, we have some spammers even within our own house sometimes. So we really don't wanna share with other brands as well and have to worry about what's going on outside of our own company. Um, it makes it so that we can kind of keep our house in order. Um, so we actually have it set up so that our smaller brands all share one IP address and they have their own private domains. And then our three biggest brands all have their own separate sender authentication packages with their own additional IP addresses separate from our smaller brands, their own domains, their own everything. Um, so we actually only have four sender authentication packages across 11 accounts. I know it can get very confusing. Uh, <laughs> that's why they say the consultant exam is the hardest um, and takes a lot of critical thinking and there's a lot of theoretical. All right, so reply mail management. Uh, we've talked about most of this already. Um, uh, yes, I guess the piece I did forget is you can also take a lot of those keywords and you can also forward the email to um, different people depending on what you need. So say you had someone reply with some type of customer service issue to an email that came from an integration with Service Cloud. When they reply back, if it needs to go to a different person based off of a keyword, you could then have it automatically forward to that other group in addition to the reply going back to um, whoever it is that it came from. Um, and then um, the conditional auto replies as well. So in addition to routing it to the person um, based off of that keyword, you can also have a conditional auto reply saying, thank you for your email, so-and-so will be back with you shortly. 
Um, a lot of this can even have AMP script in it to be customized based off of whatever data you have in there, um, which is another piece that you will learn further down the road. Um, we're not going to get into all that today because we are still setting up our account. <laughs> All right, so the components of reply mail management is you needed a, a reply email or a reply address definition. So you, within that, that is your email display name, which is basically who you see as you're from, your reply subdomain. Um, so that's basically like service at famousfootwear.com or sorry, service at service.famousfootwear.com to get really confusing uh, <laughs> or and then uh, an email reply address. So um, this appears with your from name, which is the one that they could actually reply to, um, which uses that reply subdomain. And then also the reply rules. So these reply rules are what you set in order to tell it how to process all the different pieces with it um, based off of those keywords and whatnot. And then uh, the routing address for any remainders or any outliers. Um, this is where we're talking about in, um, the forwarding pieces. So in addition to all of the keywords that you can listen to for and forward pieces, um, you can also have, if it doesn't fall into any of those circumstances, just send it to this place. Um, we actually have that kind of all else fails goes to our customer service inbox and then our customer service people will take care of it or they'll delete it if it just was some random jumble of words that um, they can't take any action on because we do sometimes have people that just need to reply back and vent. All right, and now unsubscribes. Okay, so unsubscribes. This is another um, key component that you need to understand from the start. Um, your unsubscribes can be handled a few different ways. Uh, and this is what you really need to understand how the company wants to handle their unsubscribes uh, because it can really throw a wrench in um, their ability to message people if um, you don't have it configured the way that they were expecting. Um, so the first option is you're unsubscribed from all business units within your enterprise system. Your enterprise system is all of your business units put together um, with your parent account. So if you unsubscribe from one brand, you unsubscribe from all brands and you don't get any more communications. Um, the next option is you're unsubscribed from that account only or that business unit only. So if you unsubscribe from one brand and you're a member of other brands, um, say you're a fan of Naturalizer and Famous Footwear at my company, if you unsubscribe from Naturalizer, you're still going to be able to get your Famous Footwear discounts um, and be a part of our rewards program. You can have a combination of both um, that takes a lot of custom pieces that will be built out by a consultant or their agency that they work with, um, such as Jenna, who is my QA moderator today. Um, she would be one of those people that could build out this combination of both for you. Um, or some people even um, rely on external sources for all of their unsubscribes. So um, some people will have it go back to say their CRM because you log into the website and it doesn't publish back to Marketing Cloud when they unsubscribe and instead um, goes back to a CRM and then that syncs into your Marketing Cloud and either um, updates your all subscribers or is just a separate table um, that's used as say a suppression list and set. I've seen it used both ways. Um, it's crazy. Uh, I always recommend that you use uh, Marketing Cloud to for your statuses, whether it be from an external system that you still update your all subscribers table to unsubscribe, um, just to make sure that you don't accidentally message people because you forgot a suppression list. Um, I believe one of the other nights you will cover auto suppression lists, which are one of the other ways that you can make sure that if you are going to have one of these external sources for an opt out, that you have an auto suppression list append to every single send and every single circumstance um, to make sure that those people are not messaged. All right, and here's some of our unsubscribe types. Hang on, I think I forgot something. Oh, no. Oh, yes. So um, one of the things that you will need to take into account if you have an external hosting of unsubscribes, is there are still special circumstances where the unsubscribe will be collected in Marketing Cloud only and you will have to sync it back. Um, and one of those is the header unsubscribe, which we'll talk about now on this slide. Um, so our list level unsubscribe, that is someone that unsubscribes from a list within Marketing Cloud. Uh, lists are not used very often anymore. So this one is really just, um, if you were to say have a publication list or you do some type of special data extension unsubscribing um, from like a custom profile center, that's where this list unsubscribe would come into play. Uh, master unsubscribe is basically um, a subscriber unsubscribes from every email sent by your company. Um, so this one is important to know the difference. So a master unsubscribe is your company 
a global unsubscribe is someone that does not want email from marketing cloud altogether, not just your company. They've decided they don't like marketing emails. They don't want anything that comes from marketing cloud. Marketing cloud is just a bunch of dirty spammers and they can't believe how much money these people are making off of these predatory emails. Uh, blah, yeah. I've been doing this a long time. I've gotten lots of angry emails, if you couldn't tell. Um, but yeah, there are people that do not want to be emailed at all from certain companies. Um, and I mean, it's valid. You probably have companies you don't want to hear from anymore either. Um, but that's the difference. Global unsubscribe, all of Marketing Cloud, um, not just you. You won't even be able to import these people into your system. Master unsubscribe is um, unsubscribed from your company. Um, they will already be in your system <laughs> because they would have had to unsubscribe from you. But global unsubscribe is one of those times that can even give you a hiccup or your IT team a hiccup because um, I even this week had someone that was a globally unsubscribed person that we were trying to trigger them a um, shipping confirmation or shopping order confirmation, but we couldn't get it out to them because they don't want to receive email from Marketing Cloud. So I'm not quite sure what our customer service team did because all I could tell them was I can't market the, or I can't send them an email because they are not allowed into the system. And then finally, there's the one click header unsubscribe. So you may have noticed in some of your phones and even some of your in email inboxes, there's now that little unsubscribe prompt that's at the very top that is not part of the email. That is what's considered the header unsubscribe. That's a process completely different. It's handled by your ISP and it's sent back completely different than how an unsubscribe from the unsubscribe link in the email is sent. Um, these are the ones that are only collected within Marketing Cloud because um, they do, don't even count as a click because they're not part of your email. So if you're going to host your unsubscribes anywhere else, you need to make sure that you grab these so that you also um, honor these unsubscribes as well. Fortunately, they won't be able to be sent to anyway because they're unsubscribed within Marketing Cloud. But it can get really confusing if someone used one of these header level unsubscribes and are only unsubscribed from Marketing Cloud and not in whatever your database of record is. All right, and Mobile Studio. <laughs> this is one of my favorite toys to play with. Um, I've only had access, to, well, I've had access to Mobile Studio and Mobile Push for a while, or Connect and Push for a while, but I've only gotten to be really hands-on um, in the past year. So Mobile Connect is the SMS piece. Um, you use Mobile Connect to send your SMS and your MMS text messages. Um, they cost the same number of super messages. Um, I'm missing space there, but MMS media actually can take time to download like an image. So if you have some type of rich media within the email and someone is say out in the Rocky Mountains hiking with poor coverage, it might take a little bit more time for that to render and get downloaded versus just a straight text message. Um, and then there's mobile push. Um, here's examples of the mobile pushes that I get. Um, so yeah, shoes, Pinterest, and my doggies, um, the good things in life right now while stuck at home. But yeah, so mobile push um, is what you use to send push notifications through your mobile app. Um, this will require your dev team or um, some other team to help you integrate your application with Marketing Cloud. Um, but as a consultant, you will need to know if people intend on using these tool to tools because they take additional um, work um, outside of the email pieces. They take additional opt-in um, legality pieces. Um, the one takes an integration with an app. Um, well, actually two apps because you have to have an Android and an iPhone. Um, or Apple apps. So um, all of these have lots of things to take into consideration um, and definitely change the way even that your subscriber structure can be set up because in um, Contact Builder, which you will um, have learned about in your other training sessions as well, um, a contact ID is, and how a contact is set up is very different for an email address versus a mobile or a push subscriber. And in fact, can be the same person, but three different records, depending on how your contact structure is set up. All right, and so um, here's kind of the key pieces um, within Mobile Connect. <clears throat> so one thing to keep in mind is Mobile Connect sends to an aggregator. The aggregator then distributes the messages across the mobile network. There are times when traffic gets really heavy around the holidays that you will send an SMS message and it will go to the aggregator, but it won't go to your phone right away. Um, these can sometimes get held up based off of a mobile network outage, or um, sometimes your fail 
will look like it's successful within Marketing Cloud, but if there's an outage within one of these networks, those will all come back later as failures. So that is what you need. why you need to know that a mobile message or an MMS message goes to an aggregator and is then distributed from the mobile network. Um, and then one of the requirements is there's send blackout periods. So if there's certain times that you don't wanna send um, an SMS, so say you have a rather large list and it's going to take a few hours to send, you wanna make sure that maybe it doesn't cross the threshold of like 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. so people can sleep. Cause I know I would be pretty furious if I get a marketing text message in the middle of the night. Um, all right, so here's our continuation of Mobile Connect requirements. Um, keywords and short codes. So short codes are the only thing you can use within the United States. Short codes also take a quite a long time to provision. Um, they usually say a minimum of like six to nine weeks. So that is one of the things you need to keep in mind as a consultant when someone tells you that they want to have um, a mobile connect or an SMS program. Um, there's also long codes. Long codes can be are used in other countries um, in addition to short codes. Um, long codes can also reach multiple countries um, depending on the region. Uh, we at Famous Footwear only do SMS within the United States, so I don't know too much about long codes because we've only used short codes. Um, and up until recently, we used shared short codes and have just now switched over to having our own short codes. Um, and then also keep in mind the context pieces here, as it was saying. Um, so it's looking for that space after the keyword. For example, if you put add after the keyword, then it's going to add you to the list because that is what it knows that it's supposed to do with the word add. Um, and then in addition to having your um, opt-in and whatever other short codes that you wanna use for marketing or long codes if you're in other countries, um, you also need to be able to have help and stop. Their requirements, um, they need to be as part of even your terms and conditions or um, your policies that you have posted on your website, that you have the ability for people to reach out for assistance with, um, if they're trying to say unsubscribe and it's not working and they can't get out of the program. Um, and that's also where STOP comes in. If STOP isn't working, that's where they need to be able to text help. Um, and STOP is basically the same as your opt-out link that you have to have in every commercial messaging email that comes out of Marketing Cloud. Um, basically, STOP is your opt-out link. Um, and then finally, there is IP warming. So before, or now you've got your account all configured and set up. You've got your users, you've got your profiles, you've got all your security, everybody's in rocking and rolling, using email studio, and now you're ready to send. But before you send, uh, your ISPs have to actually be able to identify those records that we showed earlier, the SPF, the DKIM, and the DMARC. You do that through IP warming. You don't just send right away to 7 million subscribers out of nowhere. If you do that, that is a red flag to an a internet provider or an inbox provider um, that you're most likely a spammer because that's what they do is they get a IP, new IP address, they get it set up, they spam the heck out of a company and then they run, they basically drop it and move on to the next one. Um, so you want to do IP warming because you want to basically have that handshake. You want to start out with your slow introduction and then you want to keep gradually building on it until you build that trust with that uh, inbox. Um, and there's all kinds of guides within the help portal and documentation on the marketing cloud sites. I believe there's even trailheads on um, that talk about IP warming, but there's all kinds of um, different ways that you can go about either doing it based off of um, different numbers of people. You can pick your top subscribers that you know are most likely to open. There's lots of different strategies behind it, but just make sure that you are slowly ramping up your sending counts so that you aren't flagged as spam. As I have done here in bold, the goal is to build up approximately 30 days of sending history before you unleash the floodgates. All right, and so here's a few of the ways that I was talking about. Um, these are just a few of the examples. Um, these are some of the examples that I've seen on the consultant exam kind of over the years. Um, is either sitting, splitting non-time sensitive over various days, um, splitting your campaigns between your two systems, um, talking about migrating the volume, um, and just know that even if you follow these ramp up recommendations, depending on the time of year, you can still experience deliverability issues. So if you decide that you're going to do your IP warming, say right during the peak holiday season, uh, when everyone else is flooding the inbox, you are likely to hit some deliverability issues because they are so busy checking out all of the other senders as well to make sure that there's not phishing or spoofing or spamming going on, um, that they really have it on lockdown. 
Um, I've even noticed that some of our most established brands for sending will have little dips in deliverability around November and December because of how much everyone is sending. All right, and some additional things that are not on the exam but are good to know just for um, configuring your account um, and because I'm not sure if they'll be covered on other pieces. Um, the first one is Alert Manager. So basically for Alert Manager, what you need to know is that there is a way to receive critical system alerts um, to whoever it is that is going to run the tool uh, once you are done with your implementation. So um, you can also use a distribution list. The key is with this though, they have to be a user within Marketing Cloud. So if you're going to use a distribution list, that means you have to use one of your allotted users um, just for a distribution list. That is what we do within Marketing, or uh, within Calaris, but that is because we have so many different brands um, and I don't wanna be the only one getting those emails. <laughs> Uh, as otherwise, I would have to be the one instead filtering out to everyone. So to save myself time and sanity, I have a distribution list user that um, it then goes out to everyone whenever it fails instead. And then whatever brand it is that is in charge of that sin can go in and take action. Um, another key piece that just took effect, it, well, really took effect in January is SSL certification. So in order for you to be able to display images on <clears throat> a landing page and even um, a lot of your hosted images within Chrome, you have to have these SSL certificates um, on your account. So like I said, you need one for all of your cloud pages. It's basically the same as a website. Um, you don't feel comfortable when you go to a website if it doesn't have the HTTPS and you even get some type of red flag from whatever the browsers that you're using saying that it's not a secure site. Um, this is doing the same now for your landing pages, making sure that they also are a secure site so that your subscribers and customers can feel co comfortable doing business through these landing pages in addition to your commerce site. Um, the other one you need is for Content Builder to be able for all of your image hosting. Um, those are to just uh, make sure you have secure images and that's because Chrome now requires secure images in order to display them. Um, all of these can be provisioned within your account through your account manager, or um, if this case you're creating on behalf of a brand, you would have this as part of your provisioning um, in your um, build out plan. Um, you can also have it hosted outside um, or you can host your own, but that is only for the landing page piece. For the images, you still have to have an SSL certificate within um, provision through Marketing Cloud. I will tell you, they give you a discount when you do more than one through Marketing Cloud. You're going to pay more to just do your images versus doing your images and your cloud pages. And if you have multiple business units and you need two per business unit, um, the price will continue to be prorated um, as you build on. So they're not going to charge you the same amount if you have 100 business units or 20 business units um, as you would if you only had one business unit. That is one thing to keep in mind, although um, a lot of the billing pieces you won't actually have to take care of as a consultant. There's someone else that will take care of all of that, hopefully for you. Um, and so now we can do some Q&A. Oh, good. It's eight. I finished on time for once. You guys got lucky because normally I run over by like 20 minutes. <laughs> Good job, Karina. Very concise. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Jenna. I am Karina's co-lead at the uh, Denver um, Users Group as of what, today or last week? Yeah. Um, well, I got an email today with all of your account stuff. So I think that's Okay. Yeah. So today, today, it's official. Um, so, and I am um, helping JB and, um, and uh, her and uh, Gilda um, out by answering or trying to get answers to all of your questions and you guys have sent in some really good questions i hope we get through all of them uh, we're going to start at the top and uh, kind of go back in order of um of, well in order of where you guys have, have asked and kind of in order of the presentation okay so first off um is there a way to get a report um for which users for which users have what roles so that they can update the roles accordingly. And this question was asked twice, um, uh, once in another way. Um, uh, the second time it was asked were uh, a question regarding the uh, report of the current users with the roles assigned to them. Is there a way to get a report in which users have roles assigned? Yes, yeah, so it's the same question. Um, and I kind of briefly answered it, but Karina? Um. Did you tell them that it's basically the API stuff? I did, and I am okay. about to provide the link. <laughs> Great. So yes, there is a fabulous link on how to do it. Um, there is a way to export all of your users, but it unfortunately won't give you all of your roles. 
but you can have some awesome API developers, such as Jenna or many of the other awesome consultants that are out there, build you something, um, or you could probably even find it out in the community and just use Postman, um, which you would learn about when preparing for like the developer certification. Um, if you're not a developer, then ask someone on your technical team um, or someone technical within your team to be able to do it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately right now you can only access that information via API and then you have to piece it together across a couple of different API calls. Excellent. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so um, this is a use case. I love use cases. All right, we had a use case. <laughs> where the from address and account settings was for a business unit that was from a that was different from the domain mentioned in the SAP. Is this a best practice? It really depends on if you have um, any of your domain records that we showed on that one slide set up to actually allow that other domain. If you only allow one domain, so say your um, DMARC is only set up to allow your specific domain, uh, you're not going to be able to get to the inbox with that other domain because it's all going to be rejected by that policy. Makes sense. Be careful with that. You don't want to get kicked out of inboxes. Yep. Uh, all right. And so yes, then... you can. It can be. Um, so for example, we have a few different subdomains, like I was saying, where we have like the um, transactional one and the services one. So those are okay. But if you're doing like a completely different business or completely different domain, you're gonna to have to have some type of record in there supporting that saying, yes, this domain has permission to represent me. Yep, and speaking of, do you need us uh, separate SAPs for subdomains? No, if you have one subdomain, or if you have one SAP package, you can add on, so, uh, I don't think there is a limit on subdomains. Like I said, we have um, only three SAP packages across 11, um, business units. So we have three that each have their own individual SAP package, and then we have another, what is that, eight that all share the same, and they just have their own subdomain. Um, so they have one SAP package and then the um, seven additional, no, sorry, eight additional, because we actually use the parent level as the SAP package, and then they each have a subdomain provisioned within that SAP package. Makes sense. All right. Uh, the RMM keywords, um, will they only work in English or will they work in other languages as well? It's a great question. They do work in other languages as well if your account is set up for those other languages. There you go. So, so you have to have it provisioned. Yeah. Um, I believe it defaults to whatever it is that is your default language within your account. All right. Well, it could be bad and just default to English because some tools do that. And I only know English, so mine are always defaulted to English. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Otherwise, See, I wouldn't be able to tell what it is that, but I do believe there are, like, yeah, looking for the translations. That but, makes sense. Yeah. That, that's interesting. So RMM is actually looking for the translated unless you have it set up for, for the languages that you need it set up for. It's very fascinating. Um, yeah, I know. I know that we do not have to have like special provisioning for the word unsubscribe in French, uh -huh. um, but if there are other keywords that they use to as to represent opting out, those you get added as keywords. If that makes sense. So you, <laughs> but you could use um, dynamic. Um, well, no, the keywords are set within. You? Yeah, nope, they're key, okay. The yeah, boxes. exactly. Yep. yep. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Questions. Okay, now you can see um, I've got questions for Karina too. Um. <laughs> yeah, so on the actual page here, let me, I believe I have this page actually. Do, 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 do. Um, here's my custom reply mail management. Where's my trigger words? I might have to look up again where, you know, one of these two setups. <laughs> <laughs> oh, reply mail management. There we go. There you go. So yeah, there we go. So here are our check boxes. So common misspellings, leave, opt out, remove, unsubscribe, unsub. So any of these translations for these keywords, they're looking for. But if there are other keywords that you would like added in there, then those you would have to contact 
And then here you can see routing for remaining where I was talking about that we send it to our customer care team. Smart for the people that are really angry. Angry. Yep. All yeah, if we right. haven't caught any other keywords here, then <laughs> they go to our customer care team. Which makes sense. <laughs> All right. And yes, you will get angry customers. Karina has spoken to them and I can tell you about some too. All right, so um, let's see here. Okay, so um, where can you configure unsubscribe options from? And so I asked for a little bit more um, detail around this question and mm -hmm. um, they responded back. Um, they have a situation with multiple brands where a subscriber can exist in all and they wanna make sure that um, upon last, upon unsubscribing from in, from one brand, they do not unsubscribe globally. So that is part of your business unit setup and provisioning here. Let's go into. Here it is, the very bottom here. So you want to make you want to make sure that you have this will be unsubscribed from this business unit only on the setup tab under business units under administration. Okay, makes sense. So you can um, change, configure your global um, and your individual business unit. Yep. It's from right here in the setup screen, which is handy dandy. It's one of my favorite new improvements this past year. Um, okay, so uh, questions regarding the reports. Oh, you've already answered that. Sorry, I'm repeating questions, doing too many things at one time. All right, um, let's talk about some RMM for a little bit. Um, okay, a company sends a monthly newsletter to top shareholders, and it has a business. It needs to uh, a business uh, has a business need to re to handle replies to their CEO. They have reply mail management configured in their setup, and the team would like to reply. Um, would like the reply email addresses to re to appear as the real email address in the subscriber's mail client when replying. This so email, that is yeah. Go ahead. Under your sender sender profiles. Let me go default here. And so down here, and even some of these, like if you go under this use specified information. Uh, where was actually the reply? You know, use auto reply. So down here, you can even where it has um, this auto reply with. As you can see, we have a distribution list set here. Um, you can do some configurations with some fancy AMP script where these fields are to actually make it so that if it needs to, it could even look and see um, and change out who that from address is from. Here, I am not gonna, we'll just go into a fake one here because I am not gonna screw up our default one. <laughs> you come in in the morning full of regret. Um, yeah. So use custom settings and then use auto reply and reply using triggered send. And so yeah, here in this drop down, these are all of our different options for emails that you can get sent. And then from here, you'll you can actually go in and configure um, all of that on the actual send that you use for this triggered send because it's actually set up as a triggered send under the interactions tab. And that's where you would go in and do a custom sender profile up in this area for all of that and assign it to that trigger. But that's getting like really deep. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're entering into a uh, developer land there. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say, yeah. At that yeah. point, yeah, you're gonna need to know AMP script and maybe even bring in a developer. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to find another RMM question It's for the you. inception of sender profiles. As you yep. set up a sender profile and then you set up a sender profile to reply with your trigger from your sender profile. Oh, makes sense. And then there's, a, in this case, the CEO wants to email people so um, from them. So, yep. that would, so you would have the center profile the set thing. as the CEO. Mm -hmm. And then the email could have whatever content in there and pretend to be the CEO with their heartfelt message. <laughs> All right, this is, um, we're getting some SAP questions. Uh, here we go. 
Oh, someone answered. Okay, so we got um, back to the global unsubscribe. Sorry to jump around on you here. There's, I'm just trying to keep us in order, but the questions are coming at us. And thank you guys for sending them. We appreciate it. Um, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so well, I've done um, two other webinars today. I get a little loopy now. So. Yep. Actually, I have <laughs> two. Me and Karina have both been on two other webinars today. And so we're all getting a little bit loopy. Okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, where was I at? Um, so how do you know if someone has unsubbed at the master global or header level? Um, that is where you would usually, I query the, um, the subscribers table. <laughs> Think of where, which, so there are data views, which you will learn about later on. And those data views are different tables that are behind the scenes and they hold key information. And one of them is the subscribers table. Um, and from there you can get their status, um, the date of whenever their status changed. Um, and then some of that other information such as what type of unsubscribe. There are also data extracts you can do. So if you need to report on it, there's a data extract you can also do with a lot of that subscriber status information as well for unsubscribes. Um, if you need to say, take it out and put it in your CRM or a data warehouse for reporting or any of that. Yep, yep. All right, and keeping us on uh, unsubscribes. Uh, the one-click header unsubscribe unsubscribes from all subscribers in a particular view? Can we configure it? The list can header you cannot. This? That's the one controlled by your internet or your inbox provider. Yeah, so that's the one that pops up. Yep. So that one, they just send whatever the record is and it just goes back into your all subscribers and they get unsubscribed as a um, header level. Oh, they just changed it because they just actually improved this functionality in the release that just came out over like the last weekend. Um, so this used to get lost in an abyss and uh, my company is actually one of them that had some issues because we had some people we couldn't reactivate. And uh, one of our brands that actually uses external um, subscription statuses could not figure out because they didn't have the unsubscribe status in their um, external tool because they had unsubscribed via the header. Um, so it was only in um, Marketing Cloud, but it also wasn't coming out in the extract. Hmm. Um, so they, we couldn't figure out where they were and how to get them resubscribed because we couldn't figure out how they got unsubscribed. That's interesting. Um, but so that's where um, these features that came out in this most recent release came from is because these people used to just click that URL um, within the ISP and then it would go back and it would get logged somewhere, um, but it wasn't set up to actually be reported on. Huh. It is interesting. Um, all sorts of weird things can happen in the land of email, guys. Be prepared. Um, <laughs> if you don't think it can happen, it probably will. Okay, so um, questions around, uh, let's see here. I think we've already gotten some of the SAP questions, but we had a couple more come in. I wanted to get those covered real quick. Um, sorry. No, no, you're fine. Okay, we're gonna click. We're gonna click up. <laughs> we are going to go up to. Uh, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. Um, talked about response around management. IP warming. Okay, what's the best way to warm up and the best way to warm up the IP if the business is starting from scratch and has zero subscribers? That's a great question. Uh, well, make sure that you have all of your sender records, your SAP, your DKIM, and your DMARC in order, um, because that is going to be your initial handshake to get your foot in the door. Um, I always compare it to um, doing business when I did work for an international company and in Australia and in China, it always seemed like you had to have some type of handshake or something where you had to tell them basically where you came from in order to be able to do business or you didn't get the time of day. Um, consider your sending records to be that same handshake that you're trying to do with your internet providers um, to show them that you really are a valid company. Um, and from there, um, don't email your new subscribers every day. Um, you'll slowly build up your list. So that will be your warming in itself. Um, so just thoughtfully send um, a few times a week. Um, you don't want to only send one time a week because that won't be enough either. Um, 
I believe it's about, is it 500,000 a month for SAP that they say? What, for uh, sending? Yeah, is it 50 or, oh, I'm having a brain fart on the numbers. But basically, since you have small um, numbers, you're going to be ramping up yourself. We actually just started a brand a year and a half ago from scratch. Um, they started with zero subscribers, exactly like you were saying. Um, I made sure that I had all of their sender profiles in order with all of our network records. And from there, I just kind of kept an eye on the growth of the list. Um, if we ended up doing anything where we were acquiring email addresses saved by a contest, I ran all those email addresses through Fresh Address first before putting them in for marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and I even split them into um, two different sends if I needed to, to make sure that I was still hitting around the same normal number and I didn't have a sudden spike. So data hygiene, yep, very important. Yeah, you really want to make sure you've got good email addresses if you're starting from nothing. Mm -hmm. Because the more bad email addresses that come through, um, the faster you're going to get flagged. So you want to make sure that you're nice and clean. Mm -hmm. And there are other tools out there besides Fresh Address. There are lots of email validation tools and scrubbers and whatnot. That's just the one that we use at my current company. That's true. There are plenty. Um, yep. I'm going to go back to unsubscribes really quickly. There are a couple more um, IP warming uh, questions, but um, I missed this one on unsubscribes. Is there an out of the box report in Marketing Cloud um, to report on unsubscribes per business unit? Yeah, well, there's your data extract. There's also, you can even um, report on unsubscribe rates. It's really um, whatever you're wanting to report on. There's a few different um, reports actually that you can do, depending on if you're wanting to. Um, See if there's like certain um, domains say that are unsubscribing. There's even alerts out there. So say you suddenly have an uptick in people like bouncing or unsubscribing or something from a specific domain. Um, you can even get alerts for that outside of even a report. Um, and then, like I said, there's also like your unsubscribe rate. Um, there's a report on unsubscribe reasons. You can even create custom unsubscribe pages where um, it does similar to like MailChimp where you ask them why they wanted to unsubscribe and submit it. Um, and you could extract that out and do some reporting on that. Um, it's really however you want to set up. And then even Lots like say methods. here, let's go into our tracking here real quick for one of my... Yeah, you can see individual. So you can even go in yep, on the individual email level here and see how many unsubscribes there were. And you can even, like, it'll give you the percentage here and you can extract these people. Yeah, this is a really handy screen if you want to um, narrow down your results from an individual. Yep. Send. You can get all kinds of information here. Okay. And here's another little trinket that, like, apparently a lot of people don't know about is if you go to the second tab here mm -hmm. um it will actually give you a heat map although if you use amp script like we do for this one it kind of bunks it out yeah <laughs> um, but it'll give you like a quick view of your top clicked links here which i'm not surprised that seven percent is for women because um, we mainly market to women and i believe this was also a women's segment that we sent to um, but yeah, so this is kind of a quick way. And then it also has where you can even do it if you want to extract it out for reporting. You can do the data view here. And then if you ever want to become a marketing like rock star within your company, if your company ever sends out something where they accidentally had the wrong URL in an email, if you had more than one URL, um, which we don't in here today, um, you could actually go into here and you're able to edit some of these behind the scenes after a send and save the day. So say they accidentally linked to the wrong landing page and the email went out. Um, this little job links tab here um, will let you actually find whatever that link is and swap it out in real time. However, I'm going to make a little caveat here. All that AMP script that Karina has down in that link there. Yeah, that um, you can't fix. <laughs> you cannot change that. So if your your links are being driven in dynamically um, using yeah, AMP script. I was trying to find a better one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You will not be able to um, change those links uh, post sent, but that is that that is a great, 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 great tool. All right, so back to. Can I forget to check a box on our sends? Sorry. <laughs> I'm like, where are all of my links? <laughs> all 
All right. So um, let's go back to IP like one of these has to have job links, right? Okay. Oh, I'll have to look into that. Later. All right, so back to IP warming, because this is a great question too. If an IP gets cold with a low volume after initial ramp up and a high volume, uh, do we need you to gotta warm it rewarm up it? You got to yeah. rewarm it. What is Don't let what it get cold. Send to at least, um, try and send to at least like at minimum. Oh, I guess it really depends on your subscriber list. So as you can see, we have millions of subscribers. So they tell us we need to at least send to 100,000 subscribers at a minimum in a month if we were not going to send at all. Um, if your list is really small, um, at least send once a month, even if it's just like to a small group. You just want to keep it fresh and show that it's still active. Otherwise, you could get flagged as, oh, somebody may have hijacked this account now and started sending again. Even if you're not sending a sales, adver you know, advertisement or something like that, just send something to your consumers, letting them know that you're, you know, still around when they need you. And this is one of those times that if you do have like transactional related triggers and whatnot, if they aren't sharing an IP, that will, even if you don't email, that will keep it warm. Exactly. All right. Then so yeah, there are pluses and minuses to doing it either way. But yeah, one of the bonuses is, if, yeah, if you are a low send volume, sharing your IP across your transactional triggers or any type of trigger and your commercial sending will keep that IP warm. This is a great question too. Um, if you're in the middle of an IP warm up and there's an email security issue with spoofing unrelated to your IP warming, will this impact your deliverability as you warm your IP? Yep, you gotta roll it back. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's even, yeah, if it doesn't have anything to do with the warming, it's still flagging um, as possible fraud. And so you want to give it time to clear up. Um, you want to make sure that your network team team is working to get that in order as soon as possible. Um, and then you'll want to do a slow kind of warming ramp up period again. You don't want to just, okay, everything's fixed. Let's go again. You will get caught. Oh, and maybe uh, add some checks in your DMARC record. Um, yep. Or your DKIM record, sorry, not DMARC. Yep. Um, speaking of SPF and, and DMARC and DKIM, um, all right, uh, this is a great question. And it came from a wonderful individual. You know who I'm talking about? <laughs> all right, so uh, DMARC. I, like, is... I don't even know who's all on. I can't see the question that I have, actually, for some reason. It's not showing since I presented. Oh, that's not fair. Okay, well, this is, this is a co worker of mine currently and someone you know very well. Uh, so, um, uh, question is, uh, I'll just say her, it's from Miss Mary Curtis. And, um, Yay! Hi, Mary! <laughs> all right, is DMARC uh, subdomain specific or does it affect the root domain as well? If so, uh, so if we deploy out of Salesforce Marketing Cloud with email.company.com and the company's IT team has their own DMARC set for company.com, do we still need uh, do we have to have them included in the SPFs, S Salesforce Marketing Cloud's IPs on the DMARC settings for the company dot domain, so the parent level domain? Oh man, I went through this too. When I know. I, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> That's um, a great question. I believe it's inherited because the subdomain is a part of the main domain. It's not the same for the subdomain. So you have to declare the subdomain, but the parent domain will be fine. And DKIM records are unique to the subdomain, right? Yes, those, because those are keys on a handshake. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, you have to have one for each version of what you're sending. So that okay. way that's the handshake key for each one. Oh, there you go, Mary, I got it mixed up. So DKIM is the subdomain specific and DMARC is inherited from the parent down um, but double check us on that you might want to yeah you want to declare your subdomains but your parent domain because it is the parent of the subdomain will automatically be part of that okay. so like in marketing cloud you only need the email dot whatever domain um, you don't have to also have the parent domain makes sense and i since i know who asked the question will try and dig up that email thread. <laughs> you might have to shoot me an email though to remind me or a LinkedIn message. <laughs> uh, 
All right. And but uh, I know I asked someone... that specific question to Marketing Cloud. Oh yeah, it's a, it, it, it's it's a great question, and um, there are classes out there that um, um, talk about all three records, their differences, and how to apply them within your DNS settings, too. Um, and then, oh, where's my little book? There is a, another great question. Can you explain DMARC and DKIM a little bit? This book bit? is also great for by Chris Aaron Arndale. I always oh, butcher Chris, his last yeah. name. Deliverability uh, Inferno. Fresh is address. Like, yeah, 100 pages long and breaks it down great. Absolutely. Um, and he they, they offer a training class, don't they? On um, Or a certification? Um, I was actually certified by Chris back when he still had his thing. So Me I too. And another, I, I want to say like, Inbox Pros. That's who he was with. Inbox, um, yeah, he was with Inbox Pros. But um, they're but I do believe Fresh right Address now. just launched a certification as well. Okay, so Fresh Address launched a certification. That's the one I was thinking of. But Inbox Pros used to have one. I think Trendline still offers that certification, but I'm not 100%. We can check on that. And someone is asking to explain the difference between DMARC and DCAM a little bit. Um, well, uh, okay, so DMARC and SPF are related, and then DKIM is specific for Google, for Gmail. Um, but uh, again, you might want to do some Googling. There you go. Thank you. Oh, if it opens. There we go. There you go. So basically, DMARC is a, um, you set in all of your different pieces. Um, so that you actually, um, you have the option of allowing, quarantining, or rejecting based off of um, your identity. And then it sends reports back to whoever your network administrator is. It's the only one that has like a feedback piece tied to it. Uh, DKIM is like I was saying, uh, it's an encryption key that you have one that's set within Marketing Cloud. Um, and then the other one is set on your um, network. And so it basically all of the ISPs go out and look and make sure that this key and this key go together based off of the registry. Um, and then it says, okay, you're allowed to go through. Where DMARC is basically um, going in, looking at what all you have in there for your other two authentications, and then saying the following people or locations are trying to spoof you. And the first time you see a DMARC report, it's going to be terrifying. I will warn you now. Um, <laughs> I actually was the one that had told my company that we needed to um, implement DMARC. And so the first time that they got back, they allow all report and saw all of the different companies in China that were trying to pretend to be our different shoe brands. Um, I almost broke our networking team. <laughs> so, um, but that is why you put this in place is so that people can no longer spoof and pretend to be you. Um, instead, it rejects those emails and the inbox will not even let them in anymore where before they went to the spam box. Very true. Uh, so yeah, th that's basically like um, a way now to be like, nope, boom, out. Exactly. DCAM is a great way. The whack a mole. To so only the spoofers. one mole is allowed through anymore. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I we have one more question regarding DCAM and DMARC, but I want to mm -hmm. um, address a question that was asked about um, a synchronized data extension question. Um, we are going to be covering synchronized data extensions um, later in the boot camp, and um, I I don't know which day we're going to be talking about these, but um, uh, that would be um, the um, the connector, the marketing cloud connect, will be covered on a diff in a different session. So um, this That's is a great question. Time. Yeah, Pardon? that's on March 2nd. Brian is going to cover that. March 2nd. Th thank you, JB. Um, so if you will come back to that one and ask your question there, because the question you're asking will be covered there. <laughs> yeah, and there uh, are consultants that just focus on that whole connector piece and mm -hmm. specialize in just that. Um, in addition to having like this whole like all encompassing consultant piece here, there are people that just consult on the best ways to basically tie together your CRM and okay. your marketing cloud, um, and then create all of these automated pieces and journeys and integrations and listeners. And... Integration specialist. Yep. Yeah, people that know both Apex and Amscript. Mm -hmm. Unicorns. Yep. All right. You're not expected to know Apex for this. That no. is the other side. So just that's why you haven't heard that word before now. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a certification in another of yep. the clouds, um, sales or service cloud. Okay, uh, so um, do you have to configure DMARC and DKIM and the SPF or does Salesforce Marketing Cloud do that for you? 
A little bit of both. Um, you usually sync up your networking team with Marketing Cloud. So your networking team will have whatever um, records that they have that they <clears throat> already set within for your website hosting and all of that. Um, because some of those records can only be accessed by your networking team um, for your actual company. And then other pieces can only be accessed by Marketing Cloud because they're the Marketing Cloud specific one. You can't set any of these records in Marketing Cloud. You can only open a support ticket and give them the information and they will set it behind the scenes. And it's part of the SAP, right? Yeah. Well, it's, you can also set these even outside of having SAP. You can, you absolutely can if you don't. But there are, I can't remember. But there are benefits to that yeah. sender authentication package. Um, yep. Like they will support you if you put the record in the wrong place in your DNS. So I highly recommend using that. Yep. All right. They will also help with your net, guide your networking team on where to put things if needed and send them documentation or even do screen, screen shares and whatnot when you have SAP. Um, all right, and we are right at time. So I'm gonna call it with one last question. And I don't know if this is a question that, uh, I, it's it's one that I, I wanna say yes to, but I'm, I don't have experience with one. Um, uh, someone is asking if Fresh Address is comparable to zero bounce. Have you used zero bounce? I have not used zero bounce. I have not either. So, uh, so check in them the past, both out. like <laughs> three years, there has been a huge explosion in list scrubbing and cleaning as things like GDPR and CCPA, um, as more and more compliance pieces start coming into play more and more companies are coming out to make sure that your data is intact and that your data integrity is in fact um, good before it even goes in. So a lot, so it's really become like a hot thing now. So it used to be like all of the AI companies out there doing the venture capital. Now it seems to be that a lot of these places are doing a lot of the data cleaning and integration type stuff. Um, or even, you know, there used to be a whole bunch of the different, um, oh my goodness, like, 250 okay in return path, but now they're mm -hmm. all now they're all one. So um, there's, there's it ebbs and flows. So here in a few years we may be back down to only like three or four quality ones. But right now there's a whole slew of them until they all start acquiring each other. Um, yeah, they, I'm trying to think of the one that they they've all been purchased lately by different um, either mm -hmm. ESPs or uh, agencies. <laughs> I know, that's why I'm like <laughs> the mountain. That was everybody used to be yeah. e-data source. That's the other. I'm like, e there you thank you. I was thinking of them too. <laughs> I was trying to remember. Well, yeah, name. there were all kinds of them, but now they're like two. Mm -hmm. uh, fresh address. Oh man, there's there was um, one that started with a D. Anyways, um, all Just, right. Yeah, validity or valid. Yeah, but they used something. to be called something else too. That yeah. uh, validity used to be a uh, return path, right? Oh no, yeah, that's the sort of thing. No, there's another one with a V that keeps emailing me. Um, yeah, okay, there you go. But there's a lot of services out there. Just Google them. Um, yep. All right, and you know, uh, test them. You know, and remember, you get what you pay for with a lot of services. So, um, okay, I think we are. I think I've answered all. The, I've asked all the questions that we got in the chat this evening. Thank you, guys, everybody, uh, for joining us and. Um, Debbie, you want to close us out? Yeah, yes, Jenna. I have a couple of uh, announcements. Um, so I have shared all the useful resources in the chat window, and we will be sharing those on the Slack channel as well. Please um, stay on top of the messages on the Slack channel. Any updates or any uh, resources, we will be adding to the Slack channel. And the announcement of the day. Um, so we have a few Salesforce certification vouchers to give away. So uh, the first and foremost criteria to be eligible for uh, the, uh, to, get, to win the vouchers is to attend all the sessions in this bootcamp series. So this is only specific to the attendees who have joined us today. Uh, we're not going to announce it on the Slack channel or on Twitter or any other social channels. So it's going to be specific to only to the attendees of this session today. So make sure that you attend all the other sessions in this series. And with that, uh, we can call it a wrap. Uh, we will uh, keep the communication going on the Slack channel and I hope to meet, uh, see you again next Thursday. And the topic for that is going to be the Automation Studio by Greg. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>